Good afternoon. I'm Louise Knight, director of the Harry J. Duffy Family Patient and Family Services Program. And on behalf of the Kimmel Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins, I am pleased to welcome you to our eighth annual Cancer Survivorship Conference, session one, Cancer and COVID, what we have learned. We have an exciting series of workshops planned for you. They will be held on each Thursday in October from noon to 1245, and we hope you continue to join us throughout October. These events um, are offered to you through the generosity of the Harry J. Duffy family, for which we thank them. Some details about this virtual workshop. You may offer a question or a comment through the Q&A box located at the lower portion of your screen. But given that we are over 200 in attendance today, we may not be able to answer your question specifically. However, we will do our very best. And given that I know our speaker for over 30 years, I'm confident he will address your questions. Allow me to welcome Dr. William Nelson. Dr. Nelson is the Marion Knott Professor of Oncology and Director of the Kimmel Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. A graduate of Yale with a goal towards a career in law, he shifted his lifelong direction into medicine. A Johns Hopkins University Medical School graduate, Dr. Nelson is a professor of oncology, urology, pharmacology, medicine, pathology, and radiation oncology. He has a specialization in treatment and research of prostate cancer. Thank you, Dr. Nelson, for sharing your time with us today, and welcome. Well, thanks, <clears throat> Louise, and uh, I have to say the dedication uh, uh, for Louise Knight, for Rhonda Cooper, and all of the folks that work at the Duffy Family Patient uh, Services Program at the Kimball Cancer Center, the dedication to survivorship is really evident in that we're in our eighth annual survivorship conference, and we're having a survivorship conference despite all attempts to subvert it with plagues and viruses and all these kind of things. <clears throat> but the commitment to cancer survivors is a, is a very real one, and I congratulate you for it and on your eighth, eighth year. Um, so uh, what uh, we thought we could talk a little bit about today is what the sort of intersection between uh, SARS-CoV-2, the pandemic, and the COVID-19 illness and uh, cancer, and, and what this has meant in terms of cancer care, research, and, and other things. And what we've learned from our brief experience dating back obviously till February and March of 2020. If I can have the next slide. Um, hopefully. Maybe. Um, we, may be, we may be stuck. Um, are we stuck? In, in any event, uh, the next slide was going to uh, uh, say something about <clears throat> financial relationships that merit disclosure. I have only one, actually the slide in fact suggests I have none, but I have one. And then I serve on the scientific advisory board for a company called Cepheid, C-E-P-H-E-I-D, which is one of the most significant vendors of the SARS-CoV-2 tests. My relationship with the company has little to do with testing for viruses. They are trying to build cancer tests. That's what I've been helping them uh, doing. Um, as they get the slides ready now to move to slide uh, two or three, I guess, um, <clears throat> let's take ourselves back to uh, the first week of March of 2020 in the state of Maryland. Um, in the first week, of course, Governor Larry Hogan had confirmed three cases of uh, a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what's SARS? It's the serious acute respiratory syndrome, something that infects the lung. COVID is the coronavirus, and it was designated coronavirus 2 to distinguish it from the serious acute respiratory syndrome virus, or SARS, that had uh, uh, risen up in Asia a number of years ago. It was believed to cause a syndrome, right, symptoms and an illness, uh, that was termed the coronavirus uh, disease illness of 2019, or COVID-19. That's where those two names come from. So the first week of March, Governor Hogan uh, confirmed three cases of COVID-19 in Montgomery County in Maryland. All three of the people infected <clears throat> were together on a Nile River uh, cruise ship 
And uh, unfortunately, as they did the contract tracing at the time, one of them had visited a fairly large gathering in a nursing home. And so there was a lot of worry about disease transmission following. Uh, fortunately, all three of them recovered fully over the next few weeks. Over the next two to three weeks, as many of you remember and know, Governor Hogan acted to postpone the primary elections. Remember, we were in the midst of a presidential and uh, primary election and primaries for other offices. Uh, he closed schools, casinos, and all non-essential businesses, delayed the Preakness from its usual date, and uh, ultimately issued a formal stay-at-home order. It was to stay at home unless you were going out to get groceries and whatnot. The impact of that <clears throat> broadly on medical care is all uh, non-urgent uh, surgical procedures were discontinued and delayed. Um, all non-essential visits um, were put on hold as well. And uh, uh, and the medical systems throughout all the hospitals in the state needed to brace themselves um, for a, a deluge of uh, COVID-19 cases. And uh, there was a great deal of concern for this, of course, because the reports out of Wuhan, China, where uh, the epidemic first took root, and out of places uh, like New York, and many of us have lots of contacts on these hospitals in China and here in the US, we're really describing quite a nightmarish scenario that uh, hospitals were being overwhelmed. The need for intensive care, mechanical ventilation was outstripping the ability to provide it. Um, and that this was uh, very scary uh, indeed. <clears throat> the earliest uh, reports related to cancer in that scenario suggested that cancer patients in Wuhan were disproportionately affected, disproportionately affected and uh, had their lives threatened and shortened. Uh, surgical procedures were thought to have as high as a 30% complication rate in the setting of COVID-19 infection, and everything sounded like a mess. Um, there is a, a, an article which we've tried to distribute for you that I was able to write early on in a lay publication called Cancer Today. It's one of the most commonly circulated when I serve as the executive editor <clears throat> about some of these issues, so you can re read through it as well. If we can have the next slide. So got the slides working. So what did we need to do and do extremely quickly? And very similar things were done by other hospitals and health systems in this region, uh, in particular in, in the first uh, last couple of weeks of March and, and the beginning of April. We needed to, we felt respond as a system of care. Johns Hopkins Medicine has six hospital sites, 41 ambulatory care sites, its own home care company, and manages uh, several insurance products. We needed to ensure that there were standards for clinical care so that every one of the hospitals delivered the same quality of care using the same uh, logic of care. As we learned something about this new virus, we needed to make sure that that knowledge, if it could benefit people, was shared immediately across the whole system. <clears throat> we needed to take steps. As many of you remember, there was a lot of concern that we needed to protect the workforce who were the frontline workers delivering care to, to people with COVID-19 illnesses. And we need to do so by providing them the right to protective gear and uh, shepherding people through uh, evaluation and care in such a way that they were minimally infectious to others. This involved <clears throat> building and reinforcing a supply chain for personal protective equipment and for testing supplies. Uh, the only way to know who was infected and who wasn't was uh, to, to use a test. And of course, uh, one of the things that we learned from the experience in Italy was that the, most of the people who were showing up with the illness early on, the illness looked for all intents and purposes exactly like influenza, which was running rampant at the same time. Uh, and so how do you distinguish between who has influenza and who has this uh, COVID-19 illness, which is definitely more virulent in the sense that more people required intensive care, supplemental oxygen, mechanical ventilation, et cetera. <clears throat> we re realized that we needed to redeploy our workforce uh, quite substantially, physicians, nurses, and many other personnel, there were at least 250 of our faculty members who ultimately ended up being engaged in COVID-19 care or research. Remember, before the pandemic, there was no one engaged in COVID-19 care or research for all intents and purposes. We turned all of our anesthesiologists, remember we stopped doing elective surgery, so we turned our anesthesiologists, they're very good at working ventilators into intensive care providers. Uh, our, one of our orthopedic surgeons, we were not doing elective joint replacements. One of our orthopedic surgeons became head of a facility 
jointly operated by the University of Maryland, the state of Maryland government, and us at the convention center, so-called convention center field hospital, still operating to provide COVID-19 care. And we use research nurses to provide uh, screening at the door at the bedside and uh, steering people towards testing. We recognized quickly that the ambulatory care that we were going to provide needed to have a different logic to it. Having people aggregated together who were sick and stuff them into a waiting room, that's not the best of medicine anyway, but having them in a waiting room, people who were sick uh, waiting for a long time was just not something that was going to be make any sense in a time when we were worried about transmission of an infectious virus. And we had to take very special consideration for the socially disadvantaged people without consistent access to healthcare and healthcare services. So Johns Hopkins the University of Maryland and the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield provider in the state of Maryland Care First came together to build a phone resource. So you could call and say, I'm worried about COVID-19 or I'm worried about anything. And they would steer you to the right place to get tested, the right place to get treated, and the right place for other resources um, you know, one thought was if you're executing a stay at home order as the governor of Maryland and almost people don't have a home, how can they stay at home? How can they benefit? So the Lord Baltimore Hotel uh, uh, was uh, created and maneuvered around so it could accept homeless individuals and make sure that they were tested and adequately cared for if they had symptoms of COVID-19. Next slide. So that's broadly across medicine. What did we have to do in the Kimmel Cancer Center? And I can tell you uh, from frequent interactions with Kevin Cullen, uh, the director at the University of Maryland, that we did many of the same things and we shared information, I think broadly across the whole country as much as possible. And when we learned something that worked, we tried to share it with as many people and we benefited from observations that people had made in Seattle in particular for us in uh, New York and, and elsewhere. We were particularly concerned, especially from the early reports, over the possibility that our cancer patients and survivors would have an increased susceptibility or vulnerability to get infected. And if they got infected, would have more um, uh, devastating or more dangerous illnesses than, uh, than otherwise. Um, we recognized that cancer itself wasn't going to go away because we have a stay-at-home order. So people were going to continue to get cancer. So we needed to figure out a way to continue to take care of people with cancer. And to do so with social distancing principles, and I'll show you how quickly we did this, we adopted telemedicine video visits. We built the capability for drive-up testing, blood testing, drive-through injections. People get injections, they never even left their car and built all these uh, capabilities and built them up quickly. We did screening and testing for SARS-CoV-2 at all of our cancer treatment sites. We recognized that we would have to delay many cancer treatments if they were elective surgeries, particularly if we weren't certain that doing the operation would comprise a, an additional risk. So we wanted to delay cancer treatments when appropriate and safe. We recognized there were certain cancer operations and certain cancer treatments that we could not delay. And so we used a special panel of disease experts for all the different diseases to see what would be reasonable to delay and for how long and what we needed to prosecute and just do our best to protect against infection and to uh, recognize infection and uh, uh, mitigate its uh, dangers in the setting of the cancer care. And the other thing that we were particularly worried about was people who were getting ongoing chemotherapy. Uh, many of you have had chemotherapy and remember uh, how we educate people to say, you know, a week or two weeks after administration of chemotherapy, white blood cell counts drop to a low level. And at that time, people might get a dangerous infection. And so we train people to say, if you've noticed a fever, um, you need to come and seek medical attention. We do a very rapid evaluation. We give antibiotics very quickly. And in doing so, the danger of that in terms of cancer care is uh, pretty well minimized. But what people look like in that scenario is they typically have a fever, some muscle aches, and a dry cough, which for all the world looks exactly like somebody who has a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so what we needed to do was take care of these people in the right setting. If you had shown up with that infection, you would have been directed to an emergency room facility with a special air handling system that sucks air out of the room through a filter in the roof. Um, most cancer care is delivered with the opposite air handling configuration. One of the greatest dangers to people with very low blood counts is the bread mold infectious agents, aspergillus and the like. And so the air handling systems in cancer and other major organ transplant units 
pulls air through the filter in the roof and pushes it out under the doorway into the hallway. You can't do that with COVID-19 because you're effectively pushing the virus out to the hallway where everybody else is. So we needed to build special units where we could have this correct air handling system for COVID-19, but at the same token and have all the right personal protective equipment, but have the ability to administer antibiotics quickly while we figured out whether this was a low blood count infection typical for a cancer patient or COVID-19 or some combination of the two. So we need to do all that very quickly. Next slide. We also had to do a lot of thinking about the uh, protection and safety of the workforce. Um, and that involved significant social distancing principles in the hospital and clinic environment. So we couldn't have physicians and nurses clustered together in a small workroom, all looking at the same computer screen. We couldn't have physicians and nurses and pharmacists and social workers all clustered together, rolling into somebody's inpatient room with you know, 20 people in a room that should be meant for two. So we needed to change everything we did in that setting. Um, we definitely uh, used uh, shelter in place at home for anyone who didn't physically need to be on the hospital campus or in the clinic. We asked them to do all their work from home and we made sure that their uh, computer hookups and stuff were adequate to uh, enable them to do their job. We had universal masking for everyone, including the use of uh, things that you know more about than you want to at this point, N95 masks, face shields to protect the uh, infection that might enter through the eyes, and so-called powered air purifying respirators is another a form of personal protective equipment. And then uh, anyone who had known or were suspected to have COVID-19, regardless of whether they had cancer, were in a unit that we literally constructed. The unit was constructed uh, within days uh, to be in this negative pressure to pull the air out through the roof so that we could manage these people in that setting. We also had ready access to evaluate all the staff for the SARS-CoV-2 infection if they believed they had gotten one or COVID-19 with ample testing uh, capabilities and significant contract training, tracing, isolation, quarantine tactics if anyone was known or believed to be infected. What's interesting is that all across Johns Hopkins, I think there's 79 to 80,000 employees. Uh, the last I looked, there were, sorry, the last I looked, there were a total of a thousand people or so that had been infected. That's actually less than the community uh, uh, transmission rate. So the hospital, with all these measures, proved to be a very safe place, even though this was the place that people with known COVID-19 infections were coming. One way, other way to look at that is all these maneuvers work. All this masking and quarantining and isolation works, uh, almost none of that thousand people got their infections in the hospital. And the very few that did, we believe early on were at times when they gathered together in break rooms, took their masks off while they were eating and talking. So what we ended up doing uh, in April is we closed all the break rooms. So you can't, can't do that. So at the, very rare to have some patient get infected or a physician uh, or nurse get infected in the workplace by taking on all these maneuvers. Next slide. Here's one of the things that was just astounding. If you looked uh, in the week of March 2nd, right at the beginning, <clears throat> this was a typical week for us, we saw 205 new patient uh, visits. Uh, these are two of the Vera buildings, so these are people with advanced or metastatic cancers. We did uh, about 1,600, 1,700 follow-up visits. This is just a typical week. Um, none of those visits, the new patient visits or the follow-up visits were done with a video or telemedicine visit. By within one month, um, we did uh, less new patient visits. Remember, there was a travel ban. You couldn't move across states. You couldn't drive to go get visited. So we had to figure out different ways to help people. But if you look at even our follow-up visits and our video phone visits, remember, some of the follow-up visits were for infusions. You can't do that over the phone. But uh, look at how many video visits we did. 71% of our ambulatory interactions were accomplished uh, via telemedicine. The interesting part about that is that uh, this appears to be a very convenient tool for certain visits. I suspect maybe about a quarter of these will continue even after this pandemic has resided because of the convenience and uh, the degree to which people with cancer, under cancer care, appreciated this mode of visit if there's just need to check in at some point, driving all the way down here, parking, navigating all this, if it's not necessary, can be done by a visit, video visit. I suspect you'll see more of this in the future. Next slide. The research, so we had to completely stop uh, laboratory research and we did this as an institution. All laboratory research stopped unless the research was on 
uh, COVID-19, how to detect it, diagnose it, and treat it. Uh, that research we, we continued, and we did so uh, you know, with uh, uh, dressing up people in significant personal protective equipment and the like. We uh, <clears throat> had a number of good ideas for clinical research broadly across the uh, John, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Many of them originated from our cancer research community. Um, so there were a solicitation uh, from our National Cancer Institute and from a philanthropic benefactor here. And just from the Cancer Center, there were 20 COVID-19 proposals for clinical trials to try and treat this illness within the 72 hours of this. Uh, Elizabeth Jaffe, who's our deputy director, and I ultimately were charged with managing all COVID-19 clinical trials research for all of Johns Hopkins. Um, it turns out that uh, the cancer, as many of you remember and are aware, uh, cancer uh, care in, has integrated clinical research in a very seamless way that has not traditionally been true for other branches of medicine that needed to happen for COVID-19 so we could arrive at the best quality care the quickest. Um, we were able to do a number of things too. We operate a, uh, a manufacturing facility in the cancer center. It manufactures uh, pancreatic cancer vaccines and these kinds of things that uh, <clears throat> the biopharma industry hasn't learned how to make yet and they're manufactured in such a way that we can use them in clinical trials. We uh, dedicated this good manufacturing practices facility to building SARS-CoV-2 test kits. Our pathologist came up with one of the very first um, diagnostic tests that was granted emergency use authorization by the FDA. We're one of the first groups to do any testing. And we built our own test kits delivering 50,000 just within the first couple of months so that we could do testing all across Maryland. Cepheid, the company I am involved with, my, my relationship with them, we had Cepheid uh, instruments in research laboratories here in the Cancer Center trying to figure out ways to build new cancer tests. <clears throat> Those instruments were usable <clears throat> in a number of different uh, settings uh, it, throughout hospitals, throughout the health system. So we talked to the company, said, look, we're not going to do research now anyway. We'd like to use these um, uh, to uh, do the, uh, make the test more available to more people more quickly. And so we deployed these at a number of sites to increase our testing capacity as fast as we could. Next slide. So uh, a little bit about where we're at now and why this has been such a tough problem and sort of what you can expect to see uh, going forward. And I actually believe uh, you may already sense that I'm somewhat optimistic. Actually, there are some reasons for optimism uh, moving forward. So the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, as we mentioned, there's literally a picture of what it actually looks like uh, from an electron uh, micrograph. You can see it's a, a ball, uh, and that ball surrounds RNA. Uh, RNA, I find for most of you, is a, a something that's an answer to some questions on crossword puzzles, but it is uh, one of the blueprint kind of things to make proteins and whatnot, in this case, virus proteins. So it's captured in a ball, and these uh, red uh, things popping out are the so-called S protein or spike protein. They pop out in such a way that when you use another way to look at the virus, they look like a halo around the virus, hence a corona, hence the name of these viruses, coronavirus, is where it comes from. This is the seventh coronavirus now known to cause human illnesses. There's the other ones listed for you. The first four caused the common cold, and it is likely that most of you have had all of them and have had them more than once uh, over uh, the time of your life. The MERS, Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome Virus, COVID-2, and the original SARS uh, have a different sort of route of infection. They cause much more severe uh, lung illnesses, and of course, the SARS-CoV-2 is in that family of viruses, not so much in the common cold family. The virus likely jumped uh, across species where they infected and didn't cause as severe an illness in bats and pangolins. There's some argument as where it went first and where it jumped first between bats and pangolins, but it ultimately got to humans. There was a whole bunch of silliness for a while that it was a genetically engineered virus as a weapon of war. That's clearly not true based on the sequencing analysis of all the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 infections all across the world. What's interesting uh, or what's nefarious about this virus that it is unimaginably infectious, perhaps more infectious than just about any virus we've ever known. Um, there's a way you uh, score infectiousness. It's this R sub zero or R sub naught, you'll hear people call it. What R sub naught is, if, if I have an infection, um, R sub naught says, how many people am I likely to transmit that infection to 
as a symptomatic illness. And what this means, if I have a symptomatic uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 infection, I am likely to pass that to six different people, 5.7, six different people. And by the way, this is only estimated based on the propensity for them to get a symptomatic infection. As all of you are aware from watching the news, there's at least twice as many asymptomatic infections as symptomatic infections. If that's the case, one person can infect as many as 12 to 15 people. This is tough. And just to give you a hint of how bad this is, the 1918 influenza pandemic, the infamous Spanish flu that everyone's talked about, the R sub naught in that was only one to three. You're only likely to pass this to one to three additional people, not 12 to 15. And the uh, last pandemic, which is the H1N1 influenza pandemic in 2009, again, was just one to one and a half or so. So this is the most incredibly infectious thing you will ever see in your lifetime, I hope, which is why we have to be vigilant across the population wearing masks and taking these measures. It also means you can do some mathematics and it is very likely that we'll need somewhere on the order of 80% of everyone in the US and probably everyone across the globe to be protected in some way against the future infection, either by using vaccination or by having them already be infected and having recovered. The reason that's challenging is that most vaccines protect about 50 to 75% of people that are vaccinated. Uh, so this is why this is such a challenging thing. We desperately need a vaccine and uh, we desperately need to be uh, very compliant with it and also navigate the logistics of making sure everyone gets vaccinated. Um, next slide. Um, there are a couple of targets uh, in the biotechnology, uh, the biomedicine, uh, academic folks, biopharm and stuff have aimed their uh, sights on this thing and built uh, tools and reagents and tactics that go after this thing in an unimaginably fast scale. I know there's a political argument about when the viruses, uh, the vaccines will be assessed enough to make some sense of them. Remember, this is still less than a year of never even heard of this virus before. These are the crystal structures. That's not an easy thing to get. Of the two best targets, um, one is this uh, protease. It's analogous to the ones in HIV that uh, all the good HIV drugs target. So these are a target of great specificity, something we can tuck a drug in. If we can stop that protease, it's very likely that you'll have almost no side effects and stop the virus. Lots of effort trying to build this. And this infamous spike protein looks to be the thing that when people recover, they make antibodies to it and it sort of neutralizes the virus, which is why people have thought about using the antibodies that people make, so-called convalescent serum or plasma, collect that, administer it to somebody else to protect them against infection or to slow down an infection if they have one. The other is, of course, we can manufacture antibodies against the spike protein. They've been manufactured. They're already in clinical trials. Next slide. So these are the ones that seem to have some margin of success that have been reported uh, and not uh, overhyped at this point. They likely work. They're not perfect, but they're the first steps. One is a drug called remdesivir. You can see its structure there. It just stops the virus from replicating a bit. Antibodies against the virus, the convalescent plasma in the uh, anti-spike antibodies look like they are having some a beneficial effect. The other is targeting the host immune system. When people get very sick, they appear to have an incredibly uh, vi vigorous immune response to the virus that makes them sicker than they might otherwise have been. Uh, and this is when their blood pressure changes, the fluids leak out of their lung, they need to be on ventilators and the like. Some steroid medicine, some people use this to stop wheezing for influenza, so that the same kind of logic. And three drugs that target one of the mediators of this some people have called it cytokine storm. It's a storm of things that people get that make them sick. Um, do seem to have some uh, provisional efficacy. And I think that's one of the reasons, and plus learning a little bit more how to take care of these people, why you see, even though there's a current surge, granted it's affecting people who are somewhat younger, but you haven't seen quite the spike in death rates that we saw early on because I think we're getting better at treating, we have better uh, things to treat. Hopefully that'll continue to improve. Next slide. The testing technologies have also moved very quickly. The uh, US Food and Drug Administration has a tool called emergency use authorization where they look as, is there enough evidence that this thing could be helpful to get it out there? And then we'll learn and collect more evidence after it's out there. Um, 
it's not the same as getting rigorous FDA approval for something that would take a, a longer amount of time. Uh, the result of that is there's more than 200 tests that are out there, which is not that helpful at the moment. They come in three general flavors. One detects the RNA in the virus itself, these so-called nucleic acid amplification uh, tests. Remember, I hinted that Hopkins had an in-house assay within a week. Um, but right now, the tactic is to use several commercial platforms, including this Cephia Gene Expert Express that I'm corrupted to even mention to you. I'm just kidding. It's the one with the rapid turnaround time. The tactic at Hopkins has been to use many different tests so that any interruption of a supply chain for kit components doesn't take down the whole testing system so that they're robust enough that if there's a shortage of these cartridges you can see in the bottom for the Cepheid test, then we'll use a different test. But there are tests of the virus protein itself. <clears throat> they tend to be very inexpensive and incredibly fast. And many of them are working their way to being not just point of care tests where you collect a specimen and take it to a machine, but getting a lot closer to the uh, urinate on a stick kind of test platform that you see for pregnancy tests so that you can test more people more rapidly and much more quickly. Um, these tests haven't been as sensitive. They miss some of the cases, but the other way around, they may be tests, I think, going forward that may hint at who's going to transmit the virus because if it's not so sensitive, that means if it's easy to detect with one of these tests, there must be a lot of virus, which means the person may have been likely to pass it on. So this may be a test that gets configured into ensuring that people are safe to return to work or not safe to go you know, to a concert or an athletic event or something going further. There's also some tests that, that detect antibody responses to the virus, i.e. you've been exposed to the virus. These antibodies appear a week or so after symptoms and the illness. These tests have been so far used to try and attempt to guess how many people have actually been infected. If somebody can get infected and have an asymptomatic illness and didn't know they were infected, can we do survey kind of things across populations and get some sense for how many people have actually been infected? And, and by that logic, you watch the, the various websites, there's about two to 3% of the United States has uh, been infected uh, and is known to have a confirmed case. Somewhere between two and 10 times that number have had an asymptomatic case, so call it anything you want. So probably up to at least 15 to 18%. There is a little bit of a hint that some people may be less vulnerable to getting very sick because of some shared properties of this virus with the common cold viruses. Doesn't provide a lot of protection, but a little bit of protection. So there's some argument that 25 or 30% of the US, this is the optimistic, uh, have some level of protection. Thus, if the vaccines work the way most of them do, 50 to 75% protection, and we can vaccinate a significant number of people, we may be able to control this I would argue it sometime in the middle of next year. Next slide. So all told, now we can take a step back and say, uh, where are we at in the cancer business? So we're fully back up to speed. We're taking care of everyone with cancer. There are no delays in uh, cancer surgery, uh, uh, chemotherapy, uh, elective procedures, urgent procedures. Everything is back up and going. We're using some of these adaptations, video visits when necessary, but we do infusions, we do some injections out of the car and, and this kind of business. What we have not seen is an incredible excess of illness related to COVID-19 and cancer. And I can tell you, neither has the University of Maryland. There does appear to be a subtle increase in the propensity to get infected, many of us believe now, among people with multiple myeloma and some of the uh, leukemias that are treated with more immunosuppressive agents but there does not appear to be such an increased risk among people with breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, undergoing radiation therapy, surgery, chemotherapy, and the like. In fact, actually, there are some hints um, that men with, in, in Italy with prostate cancer that get hormonal therapy may actually be resistant to uh, the virus infection, which is uh, interesting and may have something to do with how the virus works. So we're back up to speed. There's been some analyses, and I think we'll see some more of these in the coming years. What happened as a result of that delay? How much did we compromise across the country uh, cancer care and cancer outcomes? People stopped getting mammography screening. People stopped getting colonoscopy screening. There were delays in approaches to things like lumpectomies. Um, so there's going to be a price that we paid for having to shut down uh, healthcare and accommodate a deluge of COVID-19 patients. There's gonna be a price to be paid in terms of cancer outcomes. 
And I think in the coming months, there'll be better estimates of what exactly that price has been. The good news is that to here we are back up to full speed and across this region, we're back up to full speed. And in fact, it looks like we've created a system where we know better how to take care of the people with COVID-19. So even if there is a surge this fall, we're expecting not to have to compromise or back off on our cancer care to accommodate it. And so with all that, I hope that I uh, answered some questions, raised some others, and uh, made a few things clearer with the price I know that I may have confused you even more. So uh, I think we have some time for some uh, questions. And, and uh, Louise Knight described to you how that she's going to try and get some of these questions uh, thrown over into my lap via the strategy she described at the beginning. But thank you all uh, very much. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for your patience as a cancer survivor during these times. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be back to improving quality of life for everyone who hears the words, I have cancer. Uh, we're, we're back on the air, taking care of and helping people. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nelson. Um, as you can imagine, uh, one of the first questions that came in, you know, we're watching the media and we see some states that are masking, washing hands, hand, hand um, uh, sanita uh, sanitizing and social distancing, and other states who are saying you don't need to do anything. Uh, we saw that very early on. And so I think it leaves us a lot with questions about, will we ever return to some sort of normal? Um, and I wonder if you want to comment about your crystal ball prediction of what the future might look like. Will, will masks be part of our wardrobe and attire each morning? Or do you think this will return to something that we remember as the past? So I think, I think just two things. One, for this particular, um, pandemic with this virus, I suspect that uh, one or more of the three vaccines will offer some level of protection and some margin of safety, and that we will start, you know, vaccinating folks, and uh, hopefully on, on a global scale, and uh, manage to control this better and build better, you know, uh, tools in case somebody gets infected that we can take care of them, so that the threat from this virus will diminish. I think it's hard to sort of, well, Yogi Bear, it's hard to make uh, predictions, especially about the future. But I think you can reasonably guess, I think most people think that the clinical trials are created pretty quickly. They're waiting to see how effective they are and, uh, and how safe they were. Most likely in the next uh, a few months, uh, almost certainly most people think before the end of this year. And uh, the, the, the uh, uh, folks in various governments around the world, including our own, have, have uh, already, uh, supplied uh, funds and investment in manufacturing these things with the assumption that they'll work. So we're not gonna learn that they work and then say, oh my God, now we have to make some. So they're gonna be ready to go if they know that it works. And I suspect at that point, sometime towards the uh, fall of next year, if you wanna give me a crystal ball, that uh, we will be a little bit less threatened by this virus enough to have people back in school. Um, as you know, I love playing music. It's one of the things that hopefully back able to go watch uh, live entertainment and these kind of things. The longer term things, uh, there's two things that, to consider. One is uh, as the human population has grown uh, bigger, they're more in contact with uh, more of the uh, wild animals. And uh, these species jumps are the way influenza arises, many different infections arise. And one worries that there's gonna be more and more of this in one way or another which people have predicted uh, over the last several years. The travel also where you have somebody who can get infected in Wuhan, China and have that globalized as quickly as it was as a result of how many people travel all over the world. I, I think some of the travel may be a, a little bit less. People have figured out how to work without as much travel. Um, so I think there'll be less travel. And, you know, those of you who've been to Japan, uh, it is customary in that uh, country that if one has the common cold or the flu or something like that, they always wear a mask right, to, to prevent uh, uh, infecting other folks. So I wonder if wearing a mask, to your point, will become a more common feature of a wardrobe here. The other, I think, if people have heard the message is if you have a fever and you're sick, stay home. It's not just for your own comfort. It's to uh, minimize the chance to infect other people. And I think I think that will become a more common practice, uh, I, I believe, than it was. 
again, I think more telemedicine we're going to see generally for providing healthcare. I think it's because it's convenient, and uh, and I think that's probably the way we'll get go forward. So there's a number of questions coming in. Um, again, hard to predict, but do you suspect that having a cancer or another um, type of illness such as lupus might prevent uh, somebody from actually getting a vaccine? Um, so uh, there, there are uh, important uh, nuances, although they're not that sophisticated, but there are some important nuances about who should get vaccinated and with what. If you look at the, uh, the, the Moderna vaccine, for instance, it's in clinical trials, is a vaccine of a RNA molecule that has the blueprints of the spike protein. So you inject it and the muscle cells make the spike protein and you, you get uh, immunized against the spike protein. That vaccine doesn't replicate, it doesn't care what your immune system does, it would be safe to give to pretty much anyone. And we have learned a lot, actually, right, through influenza and other illnesses. So. Uh, we vaccinate routinely. By the way, we vaccinate uh, everyone who works in a healthcare setting is required to get the influenza vaccine every year. And we uh, routinely vaccinate all of our cancer patients and the like. That's a safe vaccine, so-called killed virus or whatnot. There are very few vaccines anymore that are live viruses that would uh, be dangerous to give to people with, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, immune compromise in one way, either by treatment, we've uh, uh, reduced their immune function or an illness has changed their immune function. And so what you see is these people we've been giving shingles vaccines to, influenza vaccines, et cetera. Uh, I would imagine the COVID-19 vaccine will be the same kind of rules, if you will. So the last question we probably have time for um, is really another opportunity to talk about our cancer research um, and the fact that uh, we're open again um, and I'm wondering if you want to, because uh, there's a, several questions asking, uh, has research resumed and are trials available? Yeah, no, whoever asked that question, thank you for kicking me in the butt and uh, making me remember that I was wanted to, I had wanted to tell you that. Um, yeah, so uh, what happened to uh, research is, like I mentioned, laboratory research, we completely stopped. It has been entirely, at this point, reanimated, along with the state of Maryland guidance on uh, uh, the density of people that can be in this place and the phased reactivation of the economy and the like. And so we have people doing shift work. We have very uh, high technology things, phone apps that say, uh, when you come to the door, say in your laboratory, there's two people in your laboratory. That's the maximum density that we're going to provide. You can't enter your laboratory now. And I can actually look on my phone and say how many people are in my laboratory, exactly who, a little bit big brothery, but in fact, uh, it's enabled us to reactivate our laboratory research. Clinical research, um, we managed to maintain all clinical research that had treatments that people were benefiting from. You know, if you were getting an experimental treatment and you were responding to it, we were not going to stop that clinical research. So patient care, patient outcomes were, were, were foremost in our ideas. We were not accruing people to new studies unless the, the, the clinical trial was part of their mainstay of treatment. So we went down to about 25% of our clinical research activities. The other thing is that people who were in the middle of clinical trials, we made exceptions so that they perhaps didn't have to drive in and get a blood test. They could get a blood test somewhere else and use it. Uh, that was permissible in the way uh, clinical trials are overseen by people who are advocates for the safety of the participants. But by <clears throat> as we came out of this, we needed to re, uh, get re-reviewed all of our clinical trials to say, look, we're gonna do this in such a way that the person doesn't have to come to the clinic to get a blood test on this day. That still needs to be re-reviewed. Is that safe? Is that appropriate, et cetera? So we had to get all of these things re-reviewed by the bureaucracy that oversees clinical trials to get things back up and going. And we are about, for all the clinical trials that we do, we're about at 75, 80% um, uh, up and going now, and we'll be fully back up and going with everything in the very near future. The, the clinical trials that have been the hardest to restart were the ones that involve group kinds of things, right? You bring groups together or surveys or groups together for massage and exercise. And bringing groups together turns out not to be a good thing. And many of those have been uh, suspended for a longer period of time. We're trying to figure out how to have a group of people on a Zoom and do the same kind of exercise and this kind of stuff. So 
if that makes sense. It does, and thank you. I think we're all anxious for the day um, when we can put this to the past and uh, go out and have dinner together, and um, that'll be actually the final question. There's a so number of folks. So I have to tell you one, because it's inspiring, and many of you may have read about it in the Washington Post, but it was pretty early on. Uh, a, a woman, and this is public, this isn't a, a you know, a, a, this is what she described in public, but uh, came to our care, at my memory, she was 101 years old, and uh, came to our care at one of our hospital sites in DC uh, with uh, COVID-19. And uh, there was a lot of worry that older people would have more vigorous and virulent illness and whatnot. She had secured her infection that she believed by hosting uh, an art exhibit or something like this. She's very active. Apparently, she's a pistol, from what people say. And uh, the remarkable thing about her, she survived it and did very well. But uh, she turns out and told the Washington Post, I think it was, that uh, she had also uh, suffered with influenza in 1918 as a child and survived the influenza pandemic of 1918. Wow. So, so there are some great personal stories, just like there are among people with cancer, but that's a particularly interesting one. Uh, you know, I, convalescent plasma, I would want, she'd be the first one whose plasma I would want if I was infected. So. <laughs> interesting. Thank you again, Dr. Nelson. Um, I'm sure you can hear the silent applause um, from our, from our uh, family that we've gathered here today. On the screen, folks, you will see our upcoming sessions um, starting next week and going through the end of the month, Thursday at noon. Your individual link uh, for each broadcast will be sent to you uh, the week of that event in advance. Um, and you are welcome. If you haven't um, signed up for a session that you see available, please uh, do so. Um, in early November, you'll receive a, an email with a uh, questionnaire and feedback survey, and we'd love to hear what you'd be interested in learning about go forward. And with that, we are going to close our session today, and we wish you the very best. Um, and please, if we at the Johns Hopkins Kemmel Cancer Center can be of assistance to you, and more importantly, our patient and family services program, please do reach out to us. We are here to help and here to serve you. Take care and have a wonderful day.